Hello golf fans, Chris Durrell here with Rotopros.com. With me as always is the Rotopros PGA analyst Dane Chenault and we are here to preview this week's event, the CJ Cup. Before we get into this week's event, let me tell you a little bit about Rotopros. We're a daddy-driven DFS community covering a wide range of sports and set up to help you become a better DFS player with our cheat sheets, articles, videos, one-on-one coaching, and much more. For as little as $5 per week or $15 a month, you can get access to our content and our coaches, as well as you get entry into our weekly free rolls where you can actually win your subscription. And if you use promo code RP50, you will also get 50% off on your first payment. Just head over to rotopros.com today, click on the yellow sign up button on the top of the page. That will take you to the site. Sign up. The link is also going to be available in the YouTube video down in the description below. With that, let's get into the CJ Cup. So this week, uh, we have, we're back at the CJ Cup. Things are a little bit different here because of the travel restrictions with COVID-19. Um, the CJ Cup's been moved from Jeju Island in South Korea to Las Vegas. So two weeks in a row, these guys are in Las Vegas. So maybe look out for those guys that uh, maybe missed the cut last week that have been in Vegas, not having to golf for like two extra days. That'll be a narrative we maybe want to follow throughout the week. But in all seriousness, Dane, it's been a while. Um, we're, we've changed up the video here a little bit. Instead of doing a Wednesday live show, we're going to bring you a preview video on Monday with our initial thoughts, a look at the course, that sort of stuff. Um, um, how you been? I've been good. It's been a wild uh, year since the rest, really since the restart of golf with all kinds of sports, baseballs winding down finally, NBA finished up last night, um, and NFL and college football both in full swing. So it's still a busy time and it's been a busy year for us, but um, it's been a, an awesome golf season and, and now we get a run up to Augusta, first Masters of two in about what six months yeah best fall season ever <laughs> u.s open and yeah. the masters it's just great so yeah um so i guess first of all this week with the cj cup same as it always it's a 78 player field uh no cut here so all your golfers um everyone in the field unless they withdraw are going to be playing four rounds this week um so i mean to me first thing i look at when in terms of strategy is looking at Um, your players getting points, like for all four rounds, you can go a little bit more of a stars and scrubs build is kind of one thing I always look at first of all. And that's just because your, you know, your low end scrub guys aren't scrubs. I mean, that's probably a bad word to use for them because it's pretty good field here. Um, average official world golf ranking of about 76. So, um, that's definitely one way you can go because you do get those two extra rounds, no matter what, out of all your players. So that's the first strategy thing. Uh, what's one thing that you look at initially when you come to a no cut event? Yeah, similar things. I do tend to go more stars and scrubs, and we'll get into it when I talk about some of my favorite guys. But um, it's a brand new course this week for us. Um, so, but things I always am going to look at in in no cut events is definitely guys who can make birdies and are are great ball strikers because you need that over four days um, to score for you. If they have one off day, they can kind of make that up if they're making birdies. So when it comes to no cut events, that's probably the most important thing that I look at. Yeah, and it's it, it can be a little bit compared to like showdown where you really want those guys that make birdies. It's okay if they make some bogeys, but you really want that upside with birdies and eagles. Um, the only difference is obviously for the full field event, we're getting points for finish position. So uh, one thing I added this week to the sheet, um, I, I normally had it on a separate sheet. I added it to the main sheet this week. I'm trying to put accumulate everything in terms of like catching up on you know what I've been playing. I've been playing a little less volume lately. I've been trying to add a bunch of stuff to the sheets, like you said all the other sports were going on so i was trying to tweak stuff so i've been my volume of playing has been down a bit but i've been adding a lot to the sheet and one thing i added this week was no cut event data and it's really looking back at the last two years since the start of the 2018-19 season looking at on only the no cut events um looking at you know wins top 10s top 25s average finish average dk score and i've even broken it down just to 2019-20 season which um I didn't, you know, I didn't really realize until I started putting all this data together. We had eight events last year alone that were no cut events. So, um, I guess the first two players that always, you know, kind of jump off the page: Justin Thomas, Xander Shoffley, in terms of no cut events. But definitely go and and check that data out. Uh, hit me up in chat if you have any questions on that. You mentioned the brand new course. Um, so this is an interesting course this week in that it was a private course for the first ten years of its existence, from like 1990 to 2000. Uh, Steve Wynn property 
uh, built, I think it was designed, yeah, Tom Fazio designed, but no one was allowed to golf on it unless invite only. 2000, MGM took over. They kind of opened it up to the public, and we were kind of talking about this offline. 500 bucks around, 500 US around, so that's like 4 million Canadian. So I have never golfed there for one. But you have to be staying at a win, or a, sorry, an MGM property, and you could put your name on the list from what I hear. I, I, this is not confirmed at all. This is kind of some stuff I read. You put your name on a list in the morning, and they kind of give you a call if they have room to fit you out there. So it's a pretty esteemed course. It's a par 72. It is monstrous. I think they added length in 2008. Um, so it's just over 7,500 yards. And it's beautiful looking at it. It's kind of amazing, actually, because it's like in the middle of a desert. Everything is brown, and it is just like a beautiful forest in the middle of Vegas. So... When it comes to, I guess, first of all, when it comes to these new courses that we haven't seen played before or even really seen on, you know, in terms of this one, what are some things that you look at in terms of like stats for the week? Because we don't really have a lot to go off. Yeah, I, I try to keep it as basic as I can. Um, and then if going throughout the week, I might tweak the model a little bit if we uh, find some more out about the course. But I keep it pretty high level uh, looking at overall game um, early in the week. So I've, I've got strokes and ball striking and approach. And then a lot of those scoring stats that I even had last week in my model two opportunities gained. This is on Fantasy National. And um, birdies are better gained. I have both of those. And then I looked at a little bit of putting. But I keep it – I mean, we don't know what – major proximity ranges there's going to be a lot of approaches coming in from so you can't really put that in there there are four par fives um i suppose you could put that par five scoring i guess in there but um, i do not have that right now um one thing i will say about about this course in particular i guess if you do want to see the course a little more in depth um if you want to go this far into it yeah i guess you could go back and watch uh the tiger Phil match um, just to see some of the things and the way they were playing the course and, and just some of the holes. If they were similar, they could probably be playing them from different tee boxes than they are this week and things. Um, some of these par fives are going to be reachable. Uh, if you look at the scorecard, they, they look a little long, but there is some, kind of like last week, there is some uh, elevation here. So it's not quite as drastic, I don't think, as like the, the WGC Mexico, but um, you will be seeing a little bit of elevation that helps out and makes some of these uh, holes a little shorter, like the 18th hole um, on the scorecards, 529. That's a pretty short par five for these guys. And it's an elevated tee, I think, as well. Okay, yeah. So so they're probably going to crush the 18th um, all week. Yeah. Um, and then even some of these par threes that, that you have, all of them are over 200 yards except set the 17th, but they're probably playing – around the 190, 180 range, which is still not easy. Um, but I, I think we'll see some fireworks coming down the stretch uh, with the par 5 16th, and then the sh that, that's got to be a short par yeah. 3 17th, 154, um, just a real little wedge, and then the, the gettable par 5 18th. So, um, like I said, you're going to need to see a bunch of birdies this week. It's kind of the theme of these fall events anyway. Um but that's the main thing I'm looking at, especially in a no cut event like this. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just kind of going through like the hole by hole on PGA tour.com here. And that 17th par three is over water on like a very narrow, long green. It, it, it's going to be just tremendous. So there's a lot of bunkers on this course from one uh, looking into it a little bit from my, my end of things. I think there is, I'm just going to bring that up. I posted that in chat earlier, just a little bit of course information here. Scroll up. Yeah. So we got bent grass greens. We got a little bit smaller than average greens at 55 square feet. Um, I think tour average is around 7,000, 7,200, something like that. Um, bent grass. So they're going to be about, I think it's listed at about 12 on the stint meter. So about average, um, the, the, the fairways don't look huge by any means. There's only like 24 acres of fairway in total on the whole course. But like I said, there's a ton of bunkers, 74, and they're in like some interesting spots. Like if you're, it's a lot of risk reward holes, especially my favorite hole I think I'm going to be watching this week is the par, uh, par five fourth. Um, it's over water. There's sand. If you, if you really go about it, you can hit that green in two, but that green is 
protected by sand and water you got to fly the water there's sand all around it so it's going to make it very interesting to see what guys do it's also risk reward kind of off the tee on how much of the water you want to knock off it feels a lot like um, pebble beach i think that's the 18th where the uh, that long par five that kind of swoops around um, kind of reminds me of that a little bit just in terms of you really got a risk reward so i think we're going to see a lot i don't think we're going to see minus 20s i guess my initial thought would be like minus 14 minus 15 kind of that mid-teens area there is a lot of water out there so there is an opportunity for like some double bogeys and stuff like that but i'm with you on looking at things like um we can't really we we don't have data going back to what the course actually played like like you said proximity distances i think with nine of the holes or sorry five of the holes 450 plus yards or more we're going to get some long iron so that's if you're not going after some of the long drivers, you maybe want to look at long irons. Um, but in general, in a vacuum, I'm looking at guys that have been ball striking well since the return. And even now that it's been a while since the return in June, starting to look at last 12, last 24 rounds data as well. And that's something I do on um, my model this week was last 24 rounds uh, looking at Fantasy, Fantasy National. So I'm also looking at bent grass performance. I've got that added to the sheet if you want to go and look at the putting splits. Um, but that's pretty much what we're looking for, you know, some form in there. So uh, I guess we can get into a few picks. We're not going to break it all down again. This is Monday. A lot can change um, in terms of the weather forecast, um, guys dropping out, you know, just learning new things about the course from practice rounds and that sort of thing. So this is just kind of a glimpse into guys that first jump off the page um, in terms of some form. Um, in terms of some statistics and stuff. So I'll, I'll just let you go first. Um, any range, just a few players right off the top of your head that popped off. Yeah, up, up top, um, the two main for me would be DJ and JT. Um, I'm going to be interested to see as we get closer to Wednesday what ownership looks like because a lot of these guys are um, coming off of at least a three-week layoff back to the U.S. Open, um, and now they're getting ready to gear up for the Masters. But – these are the best guys in the field, so I don't think a three-week layoff is really going to affect them a whole lot. Uh, but I will be int- – I think we see spread out ownership, so I think it's going to end up playing – be play the guys that you like. So DJ and JT are my favorites at the very top, but just below them, a guy that – and I want to see what you think about this, but Matthew Wolf, we're not used to seeing him in this price range at all. Um, he's 10K – in a loaded field now. Um, but man, he has been playing great. Um, especially with his irons, um, he can get on a roll like he did Saturday, um, and, and just rattle off tons of birdies and Eagles. And, and if you got that going all week, I don't see that he's showing any signs of letting that up. I can't believe he didn't win Sunday. That was kind of crazy in that playoff I was watching, but, um, I think I'm going to go right back to Wolf, and I hope that price tag scares some people off with all the guys around him. No, I think you're 100% right. Like you're, We're right on the same page here because DJ and Thomas are my favorites. Just looking at like no-cut events like I kind of previewed there, Thomas in 21 – uh, no cut events. He has six wins, which is three more than DJ, uh, who is in second. 14 top 10s and 20 top 25s in those 21 events. Just incredible. Um, averaging over, he's the only player averaging over 100 DK points in these no cut events. And again, that goes back to the start of the 2018, or sorry, 2017 2018 season, um, going back to the CMIB that fall. Um, so he stands out. Dustin Johnson as well. He's right up there. 10. 10 top 10s and 13 top 25s and 17 events. So those two for sure. Xander Shoffley as well. He's right up there. He's got two wins, averaging over 96 points per event um, just in 2019-20 season alone in those no-cut events. So those three for sure. But you mentioned Wolf. I think just because of those three that I just mentioned alone, Wolf's ownership, because not even just because of the price, just because of the guys that are just above him, I guess it, I guess it does have to do with the price because they're just right there in that same zone. He's going to be low owned. Um, I think, you know, if those guys are all 20, 18 to 22, 23% in GPP, I think we get Wolf at like 12 to 15% probably. Um, is kind of like my early projection. If that's the case, I am going to be probably overweight on him. Back to back runner ups, uh, tough one last week. I had him in one and done. He really pushed me up the board, but, uh, 
Yeah, he's gained 13 strokes with his irons on approach in the last two events. He's gained strokes off the tee and approach in three straight events, and he's gained 6.6 strokes putting in his last two events. It really feels like he's trending towards becoming one of the elite players um, in the game, which is awesome because it's just not very conventional. Like He's already jumped up. This blew me away. He's already jumped up to number 12 in the world, um, which says a lot for how he's been going. So I'm 100% there with you on Matthew Wolf. Um, so I guess jumping down to the next range, someone that jumped out to me right away when I was breaking it down is Louie. We were both on him. I believe that was at the U S open treated us pretty good. Um, yeah, so think sure. things went good there. He stands out a little bit in these no cut events. Um, I was kind of breaking it down. He was 25th at the BMW championship in the playoffs, but before that at this WGC event, he was 6th, 89 DK points. The WGC Mexico, T51, terrible, 61 DK points. The WGC HSBC, he was awesome. He was a third, 122.5. So he can really put it together. So it's just a matter of getting him at the right time. And he's trending coming in. He's he's made the, the cut. I know this is a no-cut event, but he's made the cut in nine straight PGA Tour events, including four straight top 25s. Um, he's gained strokes on approach in six straight events, seven straight events, sorry, and he's gained strokes putting in four straight and five of his last six. Like, things are just kind of all together in his game right now, so it's just a matter of, you know, making a few more birdies here or there, but I'm not looking out of a, I'm not looking for a win out of Louie by any means, but at that price in a no-cut event um, with his form, I think 8,500 is a bit of a steal. I know he's a little bit lower in my overall rankings, and I think that has a lot to do with some of his statistics. He never really stands out in any one true statistical area but uh he's definitely on my radar in the mid-range yeah um love him i mean he's playing we love both of him like you said at the u.s open he's been playing great just all around game for him um a couple other guys that i like in this mid-range is tony finau coming off that uh withdrawal um for covid right Uh, this is his first event back yes um so He's a guy who makes a bunch of birdies and you usually like in these no-cut events, um, and he's been playing pretty well. I mean, he gained seven strokes on approach at the U.S. Open when he finished eight. Um, his game is one of those that if that he'll get hot and make you a bunch of birdies. Uh, so I like Finau 9,400. I don't know how many people will play him just because COVID is just like a big red X at this point. Yeah, no um, doubt. Whether it was he was even felt anything or not, who knows? But um, and the other guy in this range is down in the low eights is Abraham Answer, um, fourth last week, um, looked really good. On, I think it was on Sunday he jumped back up into that top uh, five position. So he's a little underpriced, I feel, in this field as well. He's another one that stood out to me. Just it really feels like you know we were on him. I think that was early in the return. His ball striking was awesome. It kind of went away for a while. Um, you know we didn't mention him in our articles or didn't really highlight him at all in the last little bit. But he is one that stood out to me for sure. It feels like that's come back. Although the approaches have been kind of off and on, it's either his approach or his off the tee game that is looking you know, good one week. So we get those weeks when he puts both of them together. You know, we see a good week last week. He kind of rode that hot putter. He gained 8.3 strokes putting after losing five at the U S open. You kind of got to take the U S open out of it a little bit. I mean, that's not your, your normal event by any means. It's set up to be extremely hard, but seeing that he came back and gained 8.3 the next week is the positive thing because be, because before the U.S. Open, he had gained 3.4 and 2 in two events before that. So he had been riding a really good putter, very consistent that way. So if he can put that off the tee and approach and really get that ball striking um, where we've seen it in the past, where he's gaining 6, 7, even back at the RBC Heritage, he gained 14 strokes ball striking. If we get back to that, he's going to be in the top five. Um, he's got that huge upside with his ball striking and that putter. If it all comes together, he's definitely got winning upside. He may be a guy I'll maybe take a long shot uh, outright bet on as well, but he's definitely a core play for me in, in uh, um, DFS this week on both sides. And then the other guy I'm going to turn to you uh, is he's 16th in my model this week. His form has been good coming in. None other than Jacqueline Neiman. Yeah, Um can't ever get off Neiman. It's just like every single week that he plays, I'm, I'm going to be on him at this point. So it's just kind of a given. 
Um, but yeah, 7,500 is kind of crazy. Even in this field, he, he played really well last week. Um, kind of overall, I mean, his approach game wasn't great, but it was kind of middle of the road uh, and that's, and he was great off the tee and around the green. So Neiman 7,500 for in a no cut event is gonna, I'm going to take him all day. Um, and right around him, Lowry is one thing I do want to mention kind of from some of these guys are coming back um, from overseas last week. I think it was the BMW on the Euro tour. Yes. Um, so Lowry was one of them. I think Rose is one of them. Um, Fitzpatrick, Fleetwood, uh, and Hatton won last week overseas um, in that event as well. So that's just – if you're looking at recent form, um, that is one thing to note that these, some of these guys have been playing overseas over the last couple of weeks, and now they're traveling. Um, pretty long travel, but I would say that's really not going to affect them at this point. So Lowry is just another interesting one to me. And then there's a couple down in the low 7K. Siwoo Kim played really well uh, last week, and Jason Kokrak jumps out um, in my stat model. Yeah, uh, Munoz jumped out to me. He's another one in that low 7K range. He's got top 30s in five of his last six events, um, two top 10s in there, four top 25s. Um, he's been trending well, and he's super cheap, so I'll take a shot on him. Back to Neiman for a minute. Uh, more that jumps out just outside of that form. You had mentioned that he'd been, you know, right around just average, maybe just a touch below average with his irons. That hasn't been the case, like, over the long term. Um, last 67 events, he's gained almost two strokes per round on approach. Um, yep. Last 20, 1.6. So, yeah, that's definitely an area. And with his off the tee game, and putting, which has been going good. If he has the last time he gained more than two strokes on approach or right around the two strokes was a third at the BMW in the playoffs. So um, once he puts the, that irons and starts gaining a few strokes, which th that's th so minuscule, um, you know, going into the week, making those approaches. So I'm definitely on with him. And he, in no cut events, he has top fives and two of his last four no cut events. So I love seeing that upside. Would have given me more reasons to play. Yes. It. You're now 100% <laughs> lock. <laughs> yeah. Just let me go click the lock button. So those are, I guess, a few players that we're looking at this week um, that we're going to be starting with. Definitely going to be going over a few more, going over the course. Later in the week, um, I believe tomorrow your article comes out tomorrow afternoon to tomorrow evening? Yep, correct. And then my sheet, I start highlighting plays today. I'm going to have my, uh, there's another tab that will show up right beside the cheat sheet tab. It will be my rankings. It's usually 15 to 20 players, and I rank them in terms of points per dollar projection that I have. Um, and with you know with a few little notes to the side on each player and why I'm playing them. Uh, that'll be a finalized usually on Wednesday, but uh, you'll start seeing the ranks on Tuesday. And then the other thing that we're looking at here before we go, we're going to be monitoring leading up to lock, is going to be the wind this week. Last week, I think it was pretty calm, like throughout, not calm, but it, you know it was pretty even throughout all the days. This week, it looks like it could be interesting. The early report is showing like Thursday we may get a uh, early positive for the for the wave in the morning because we're looking at like five to ten mile an hour winds in the afternoon it's climbing maybe above 15 and gusts of about 20 it looks like it's going to be that way throughout the whole entire week that the morning guys but again we're at a no cut event where the gap between those teen off early and late really isn't that much but we'll definitely be monitoring it um and reporting that in our slack chat anything else you want to go over this week who are you considering for one and done oh um a good question I, I, I was talking to you last week and maybe for some of our viewers that are um, in the one and done we're both in the one over at Gup's Corner um, I've had an awful year on the complete opposite of you um, so at this point I think it's either if you've saved enough guys to go after this last um, uh, section or I think it's the fourth section yep. that they have of the schedule um, then definitely go after that. Um, I'm even to the point that I've used some of my guys at the wrong places. So what I'm doing is going after the skin um, in some of these weeks, and it might be a little tougher this week. And what that is is anybody who pick, is the only guy of the week to pick um, the winner, uh, they get a portion of, of the pool, uh, however many people do it. I think it's $4,000 through the year, and I don't think anybody's yeah. done it yet. So. Yeah. Um, 
I'm, I'm taking a shot at that because I'm so far behind. So last week I went James Hahn and of course four other people took him and he, and he did come close. Yeah. Um, I might take a similar uh, shot again at, at somebody down low. Um, maybe a Siwoo Kim, but I, I'd say some people will be on it. Like I said, it's going to be kind of tougher to get somebody that nobody else is on in a 70 man field. That's true. Um, but I'll probably dig into some of these guys in the 6K range, maybe like even a Cameron Champ or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Somebody like that. But I mean, if I was going up to the top and I had like a, a wolf, I would go back to him. If you've already, <laughs> I think you just used him last week. Yeah. Um, don't save your guys. You can't no. use them. <laughs> They're, you're running out of events, and these big name guys are not going to be playing. Um, many more events through the through the masters maybe two or three more um counting the masters so use these guys um like a jt or a xander but go ahead and pick out who you're going to use for augusta if you're going for like either the overall or uh the section the last section yeah what about you who are you leaning well i'm not going to get the last section i haven't had a great start to the final section until last week i had adam long and sam burns um, and then I went Matt Wolf last week. He got me 623,000, which was awesome because the leader of the GUP didn't have him. So I, I jumped up quite a bit. I'm up to 25th now um, with what do we got left? Uh, we have five events left. So I have an interesting situation where I still have, I was kind of worried about it. I had Justin Thomas, Rory McElroy left. I've got Tony Finau, Justin Rose, Sung JM, and Tyrrell Hatton are kind of the key guys that I'm looking at down the stretch. But like you said, there isn't too many events where the big guys are going to play. So CJ Cup, I'm pretty much locked into Justin Thomas. He's one of my favorites overall anyway. The no-cut event thing, he's won the CJ Cup twice, although it's completely different course side of the world. I'm going with Justin Thomas. I've already locked Rory into the Masters, and I will not change my mind on that no matter what because he will go. If he goes and wins and I didn't pick him, I will kick myself so hard. Um, And he just doesn't. If he goes out and wins this week, I'm just whatever. I'm going to chalk it up and take him with the Masters anyway. And then we've got the Zozo, the Bermuda, and the Houston. So the Houston I think I can get away with probably using like Rose, Finau, or Hatton, kind of as the guys using it as a warm-up for the Masters. I, so I can use one big name there, and then Bermuda Championship, I've got Brendan Todd kind of with some question marks beside him. He seems like a guy that's been doing good there. And then I got the Zozo. So I've kind of got it shaken out. I'm only about $2.3 million behind the leader. Um, so I'm still going for the overall. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm going to need at least two wins in the last five events. But I could get it. Justin Thomas, Rory McIlroy. It would be epic to watch the Masters, have Rory McIlroy win it, and I win the one and done, that would just be tremendous. But, I, you know, I'm looking at at least trying to secure a top 10 finish, um, which is still a pretty good payout in this contest of, I, I think there's around 2,900 people or something like that. So that's kind of the strategy I'm going, is I've got those two locked in. The other three events, I'm just going to kind of figure out with these final few guys. I'm just glad I'm not going to be down to like having some like four big names and one final event because that would be terrible so i'm leaving it so i only have rory left and i just i don't even have a choice to make it's already locked in (laughs) yeah this week and next week are are big purses too so uh, 9.75 million that's bigger than any of the regular of like any of the either of the two playoff events that were in the one and done, the Northern yeah. Trust and the BMW, both of these are bigger. Um, so, yeah, use a big gun this week if, if you're going for either the segment or the um, overall. Overall, for sure. Yep. And I don't know how many people, I haven't really dug into it yet to see who's used who, how many times, but I might get lucky that Justin Thomas, you know, if those two were to get wins or at least top five finishes in those two events, that I think a lot of people have already burned those two um, from what I remember. I mean, I haven't jotted it down or looked into it, but that would be tremendous if that was the case. 1,900 so. people have used Justin Thomas. Oh, perfect. So that's that's a, that's a lot. That's about 60, what, 60, 65% of the fields already used him. So that's pretty good. He won't be the highest owned this week, I don't think. No. Awesome. Uh, John Rahm is the highest, has already been used, and, and DJ are the top two hmm. in the field that have already. So there'll be a lot of Xander, I bet, this week. Yeah. I think well, he's, so. he's up there, but yeah. And even Wolf. The, those guys, although Wolf was the highest owned last week, 
I can't see him. I can see him being top five, top ten mm-hmm. this week. Um, you know, yep. back to back runner up. So fading him, you know, things need to go the right way, but it looks like I'm going to make some money either way. And I still have a chance at some big dollars. So I'll be definitely putting on a big free roll, Chris Durrell, Jaeger bombs, free roll. <laughs> if I, if I end up taking that sucker down. So awesome. Well, that yeah. concludes, you know, we looked at some DFS, some one and done. We looked at the course, uh, make sure to get over to rotopros.com, hit that sign up button, get your free trial and come in as we're going to be covering the event all the way leading up to lineup lock, including our skeleton lineups on Wednesday night, um, looking at cash, GPP. I think I'm going to be back to playing some tiers this week as well, and we always cover some sports outright, or like some sports betting, outright bets, top 20s, matchups, that sort of thing as well. So hit us up in chat, and uh, we'll make sure to help you any way we can. Thanks a lot for joining us, and let's see some green screens. Talk to you next week, Dane. Yeah, good luck, everybody.